talk is called uh, The Labors of Inclusivity, Organizing for Diversity, Resisting Privilege, and Collaborating Through Power. Um, I'm Sarah Schumer. I'm Mary Massad. Oh, that is so loud. So we are both uh, <laughs> PhD students in the Digital Media Program at Georgia Tech. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so uh, my work primarily concerns uh, issues of inclusivity and diversity in games. Um, in addition to working on different games, I also work on a little project in Atlanta called Dear Games, which is a collaboration with uh, Harris, a feminist bookstore in Atlanta, um, where we're putting uh, together an arcade actually. Uh, our key cabinet to stay in the store and do uh, ongoing events about the connection between uh, feminist theory and community and ladies. Uh, um, and in terms of my research, I'm tangentially related uh, to games, but mostly it involves activist uh, organizations in Atlanta, the different forms of technology they get used, and what that means for tech design. So, so two sort of different spaces, but both are uh, different uh, topics from uh, different directions. Uh, right, so, so back to our title. title. I know it's a mouthful, and all these words are super meaningful and they're very important. Um, but essentially, what the basis of our talk is um, is how to organize a diversity conference when you're mostly working with white dudes. <laughs> We're both at Georgia Tech. We do important work there. It's a great school. We work with a lot of really awesome people, but there are also just a lot of cis white dudes who are also from the South, so that's like another layer of complexity on top of that. Um, so just keep in mind that's sort of the context that we're coming from. Um, and so the main challenge there is how do you organize a conference where um, you're both, the content is both about diversity, but you're also practicing the value of diversity. It's not just a talking point, but something that actually gets embodied in the organizational structure itself. Uh, sorry. <laughs> and that happens through a conference called Different Games. Yeah, um, so just a little bit on the history of different games. We're actually organizing our third year of the conference right now. Um, it's coming up in the first weekend of April um, of this year. And uh, different games actually started in 2012, um, and it's sort of a direct response to some things that were going on in games at the time. Uh, 2012 was the year of this hashtag, uh, Reason Why, we were emerging, which was a discussion on Twitter that happened around uh, the answer to the question posed by uh, a moderator at um, Kickstarter their games curator who said, why aren't there more women in games? And all these women from the industry um, and uh, folks uh, who experience discrimination uh, on various axes kind of respond to that by saying, well, this is a thing that happens a lot. And kind of shared about what their experiences were. Um, and it was a great sort of moment of um, people kind of speaking openly about the issues in tech and games. Um, it also was the year that Mia Sarkeesian uh, put together her Kickstarter campaign uh, for Tropes vs. Women, her online uh, web series about um, sexism and sound of six tropes in games. Uh, trigger warning, sorry, it's a little Whoops, bit late. Sorry. For, um, I didn't for, No, no, I should have said that at the beginning of the talk, so apologies to anybody. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of harassment of Anita that uh, was incredibly disturbing, including things like uh, you know, the theater game that somebody put together and uh, sort of anti Semitic and misogynist. Uh, uh, sort of hate speech that was directed at her. Um, so these are some of the things that were sort of catalysts for wanting to create a conference that would um, speak to both the issues that women experience in games, but also broaden the discussion to be inclusive of uh, other kinds of identities that might experience discrimination in tech and games. Um, another kind of uh, former and important uh, figure in uh, at that time period, and you know to this day, um, Anna Entropy, who wrote Rise of the Video Game Seasers, came out around that time. And uh, it was, for me personally, really important because it was one of the first times that I'd seen um, somebody talk about games, DIY games, indie games, um, in the way that I was interested in seeing them talked about, which was deeply connected to activism, to feminism, to personal identity, and to uh, you know, expression um, creatively and politically. And um, a lot of the things that have happened since then, which we've been really excited to sort of highlight at the conference, have been uh, creations by, um, or you know, game creation by uh, various marginalized groups, including uh, you know women, people of color, and folks of various gender identities, and uh, who you know whose work might not necessarily make sense in certain mainstream spaces. They may not you know uh, want to go to GDC and show their work, or they might not really be welcome in those spaces because they're oriented more towards commercial uh, production. So um, so things like Twine. Uh, it, a free and open source tool for making uh, hypertext games and stories. Um, it's been really important to the conference and the community as a whole. 
Um, and so just to come back to the conference a little bit, I'm going to pass the mic over. So, so uh, our talk is mostly going to anchor on the organization process of last year's degree, so we're going to hit you real quick so you know where we're coming from. from. This can be sort of whirlwind, so if you need to, to, need to slow down, I can do that. Uh, so, so, right, right last year's different games, uh, very well attended. This is at NYU Poly. Uh, there's a space there called Game Center, which is, it has a master's program for game design. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so they very generously hosted us. And so um, this sort of came with a built-in independent games community in New York, but we also had people come from across the country, which is nice. Pretty well attended. Mm -hmm. um, we also uh, had a bunch of speakers from the independent game development scene, and we actually flew them out to speak um, because, as you might imagine, the independent game development scene is not super financially lucrative, and it's certainly not financially lucrative for women of color, for queer women, for a bunch of other marginalized identities. Um, and so we had um, a bunch of different sponsors, including institutional sponsors from Georgia Tech, from NYU. Um, we also had financial sponsors, uh, sorry, corporate sponsors, like mentioned. Um, and they pitched in and they really, you know, supported those causes with their support. We were able to fly out of speakers, and that really made a big difference. Uh, so they gave really great talks about some of the challenges in their field and things that they've learned from their own personal experiences. They were also really honest and really supportive, and it created a space where if you've been to various game conferences, like GDC Game Developers Conference, for example, um, those talks tend to be very uh, work-oriented and industry-oriented. And so these were coming from a different angle, talking about um, how to do self-care, or how to be honest about your own experiences when you're making a game about your life without you know, putting yourself out there and putting yourself at risk. So these were very sort of intimate, honest, generous talks, and uh, we were very privileged to have them all. This is Lee Alexander, um, prominent games critic. Uh, this is Todd Harper, and it could be aforementioned Kaka Ale, who uh, is an independent developer and instructor at NYU. Yeah, and, and teacher at NYU in Parsons. Teacher at NYU in Parsons. Uh, Merrick Kupis, who's another uh, big figure in the independent game development scene. Um, we, in addition to uh, sort of financially supporting our speakers and having safe spaces for uh, very intimate, honest talks, we also have content that isn't usually covered or topics that aren't typically covered in other game conferences. So this was a talk on kink and gender and sexuality. Um, we also have a bunch of workshops. So this is a post-colonial reading of a very popular board game, <laughs> which will not be named. We also had an arcade, so um, people who are independent game developers got to have their games on display, and if they chose to attend, they actually got to interact with people who were playtesting their games, so we got a lot of feedback. Um, this is a tabletop game, and I forget. Avery McDonaldo? Avery McDonaldo, um, The Quiet the Quiet Year? Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> this is called The Quiet Year. It's a tabletop game. You can look it up online and I think purchase it, mm -hmm. um, but it's about how to corporate communities in game making. Yeah, it's basically a role-playing game about community building. So, so that's pretty cool. cool. Uh, people play together, people play alone. I think this game is about contemplating our mortality, so you know, some other. <laughs> we did some of that. Yeah, a little bit of that. A little bit of that. Essential crises. <laughs> so now you're all caught up. Um, <laughs> that's what happened last year. So yeah. Uh, so we want to talk to on um, okay. what, do you want to walk okay. through these in the world? Uh, so here's some of the organizers from last year. There's Sarah, me. And, um, and here's the rest of our organizing committee. Um, so, you know, some diversity could be better. Um, and so what one principle that we really want to embody... Sorry, I turned it off. I don't know. Did it die? No, I think I just turned it off. Just hold down the button. Hello. Hey, thank you. Sorry. I have witch fingers, so I'm going to have to do Right, so um, we wanted to, we acknowledge that it was a problem or a challenge that our organizing crew was uh, not as diverse as it, as it should be, and so there were a lot of um, experiences and perspectives that were not being represented. Yeah, so. Um, you might want to, I don't know if you want to talk about this one, but uh, one of the things that we sort of uh, learned from this process and the thing that we were sort of, uh, was sort of guiding what we wanted to talk about today um, was the labor that sort of gets put into organizing an event like this, organizing any event where you're trying to be sort of mindful of uh, structures of power that exist, and uh, it definitely came into our organizing 
process in terms of how we try to uh, handle things kind of on a, you know, um, on a sort of basic business level, but also on an interpersonal level of kind of doing the emotional labor of, um, of you know, working with people who are both uh, doing the important work, but also learning at the same time that they're doing that work. So one concrete example maybe is um, we had a subcommittee organizing um, around the arcade, so we were selecting different games that we were allowing in and sort of having conversations about which games would be appropriate, both for a conference about diversity, but also in an arcade setting. Um, and one sort of axis of privilege that we had to deal with was this question of expertise. Um, we had some people who were educated in game design, some people were educated in game development, some people were like film critics. And so without sort of an actual formal criteria or checklist for what counts as diverse, like there's no capital D diverse switch that you just flip. Like this one's diverse, this one's not. This one's in, this one's out. So through those conversations, we had to sort of negotiate our different expertises and bodies of knowledge that we contained to sort of um, set out, you know, even though this game is not like a 3D first person virtual world that is mega immersive, like even though it's not sort of the primo game according to regular game industry standards, um, which sort of a game expert would uh, go for and like support. We also wanted to have games that represented other perspectives and maybe had different representations even if they weren't the most like technically impressive or well-designed games. Yeah, so we did have to sort of come up with um, kind of our own standards for things that were going to be sort of true to the spirit of the conference, but also um, uh, create a great conference experience, because obviously when you do an event um, uh, of this nature that's trying to call attention to different kinds of makers, there's also like a tremendous responsibility to do it well, um, and to have it kind of, uh, you know, reflect well on the community. And we were really excited with, you know, uh, what everybody came away with from the event. Um, you know, other things that just kind of happened, um, you know, within our organizing team, you know, there was a lot of uh, kind of ways that we had to negotiate how we would discuss, uh, or like things that would come up in discussion about, you know, people sort of based on their own identities making, you know, assumptions about related to sexuality, race, related to class, and, um, you know, the way that uh, we were able to support or not support. One of the biggest things was that um, everybody involved in the conference last year uh, either had a, a college degree or was involved in higher education directly at the time. Um, so obviously this creates a huge sort of disparity in terms of like what voices we're going to hear or sort of what the expression of the conference will be in terms of how it's curated, right? We're all curating from a place of extreme privilege, if not financially, because grad school guys, you know, right? But like, you know, but from a sort of institutional place of privilege um, in terms of access um, and also, you know, working amongst people uh, who have different sort of professional levels of experience um, means that you do a lot of negotiating if you want to be sort of, um, you know, non-hierarchical in your organizing and you want to sort of, uh, you know, embody certain values around, um, around being inclusive of everyone's voices on the team. That means that you have um, people who are tenured professors having discussions about what keynote uh, speaker to invite with people who are undergraduates somewhere or, you know, are indie game developers. And that means that, you know, as an organizer, you do some labor around trying to make those conversations go in a way that reflects kind of uh, the principles that you're organizing around. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left. We're just going to keep rattling off at examples. I think. Yeah. But feel free to put your hand up and ask questions. Um, oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. But um, one theme that I've heard pop up across some of our talks this morning here at Altacama um, was the question of age and experience. Um, and so there was some answer this morning and sort of touched on this, and I wanted to give an example from our own organizing experience. Um, we had people who have never done a conference before. I've never done a conference before. And, you know, um, and so one challenge that we have is that there are a lot of sort of logistical issues and professional issues that come up when you're hosting a conference. And if you've never done that before, there's no way, there's no way we have a, actually, I take that back. There's probably a way. <laughs> should have said that. But it's not going to include all the sort of tacit knowledge and learned knowledge that you get from hosting a conference. Um, and so one model that we sort of came up with was um, trying to identify with all our volunteers and all our, uh, who are all fantastic. They, I mean, no one's getting course credit for this, no one's getting paid, so the fact that people were volunteering to do this was just phenomenal and just blew us all away. But one thing that we did was we asked our volunteers and, you know, the other people that we were working with what they wanted to get out of the conference. 
and then tried to pair them with tasks that would help them. So one example is someone wanted to build web, web development skills, which is not necessarily a task that's at the, you know, the top of our to-do list or our diversity conference. But um, you know, we paired them up with someone who was working on our WordPress page, and so they got to develop some skills that way. Um, and so really having an open conversation with people that you're working with about what they want to get out of it, um, and sort of matching people up that way, that can be a strategy for um, sort of accommodating for different backgrounds. Yeah, um, another thing, uh, we, you know, have, we've kind of struggled, I guess, with the, the past few years, and um, I think the conference has improved each year, and I'm really excited about it this year, um, but we've, we've really, um, the way that the conference has improved has been sort of by having this like, sort of dialogic process with the audience of the conference, which is really, really wide and varied, which is one of the things that's unique about it, and it's great to be in things like this, like AlderConf, that is also sort of open to a lot of different audiences, right? We're not GDC. We're also not, you know, an academic gaming conference. We're sort of somewhere in the middle. And so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to speak to a lot of different audiences, how to work with our speakers to make sure that they're not going to deliver a dry, um, you know, uh, sociology paper um, to an audience of folks that are interested in game development, you know. And so uh, sort of having people be aware of the various audiences that they're talking to, but also being responsive to the different audiences that we're trying to be inclusive of. So this means that very, like, practical things come up, like the first year we did the conference, we put up our event right and it had a boilerplate security statement from NYE about like what they do, you know, make sure you have your ID on you, um, you know, we'll be checking it against your conference badge. And somebody tweeted at us and was like, hold on, that's incredibly problematic for me. You know, I uh, don't have a, a legal ID that actually represents my identity. Um, so this is going to be incredibly, you know, uncomfortable to have my body police that way. And that made us realize, like, whoa, we need to work with NYU to figure out how we can have better security practices that won't make people uncomfortable, but can make everybody feel safe. Um, and that's going to be increasingly a concern with kind of the safety issues that have come up around games in the past year and making sure people feel safe. But that's something we're sort of committed to, you know, reaching out to the community and asking for info on what we need it. Um, you know, and other things like during the conference itself, you know, there was issues with people using ableist language. Um, and I think we saw a great example of it today. Like, you know, the only thing you can really do is sort of stand up and say, you know, hey, this happened. Um, can we all be mindful of this? And that's the thing that came up for us in terms of reminding people, you know, the language that they're using um, and making it an acceptable space for people to make mistakes and just, you know, say sorry and own that, you know. And that's really the most important thing is for people to kind of acknowledge when they do make mistakes. Um, one thing we were saying about this year, another thing, great tip that we got was like, hey, can you have um, chairs that maybe don't have arms that are going to accommodate people who have bigger bodies? You know, that's not something that I would have thought of necessarily, but, you know, it's about accommodating uh, people who are coming from all different places and, um, you know, have a different experience of, of the conference based on that. Again, if you want to put your hand up, we're just going to keep going. Um, so <laughs> piggybacking off that, one thing that um, I'm looking at our labor point out there, and one thing that I was thinking about is a lot of the suggestions that we get and like comments for improvement come from Twitter or you know people reaching out and contacting us, but that's not something that we try to enforce. We're not trying to put the onus on marginalized groups to make that safe space that space safer for them, but rather we try to make it explicit that we are trying to make these changes and we're not going to cover every perspective, we're not going to get everything right, but you know, having that back and forth dialogue, like Sarah mentioned earlier, um, there's this trend of like, hey women, why don't you insert yourself in conferences more, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's not a dynamic that we really have to play into. But at the same time, acknowledging that there was a lot of knowledge and experience at that very useful and incredibly Yeah, um, this is also something that's come up in terms of, and what you made me think of with the whole sort of like putting the burden of education on people was um, the fact that, uh, you know, in 2012, um, when we created the first conference, we actually created an inclusivity statement which we used, and we actually read it um, at uh, the beginning of the conference and had everybody, like it actually, we didn't have a printed program last year, so it was up digitally, but the first year we actually had physical programs and people, there was a signature place for people to sort of sign, and it was very sort of like 
frank and sort of like, here's language to be mindful of, like here are like practices, like maybe you know, talking over people or you know, maybe taking up too much space that people can be mindful of in the space to make sure that everybody feels welcome and nobody feels silenced and we all can participate and sort of be a community together here. Um, and that was something that a lot of people responded really well to and it ended up sort of being used by a lot of other conferences following because at the time this sort of model um, tended to be, and I feel like this has changed, but it hasn't you know, really gone away, is the harassment policy, right? So having a harassment policy, what does that say to people? That like, harassment's gonna happen, and you know, here's like, you know, maybe the um, draconian response that we'll have to it, but that's not sort of setting up maybe an expectation for what like, you know, behavior we do wanna see, and sort of creating a way that people can maybe fail at things, but you know, um, acknowledge them, apologize, move forward, and still have a productive conversation. Um, and so we you know, spent a lot of time actually with our volunteers, making sure that our volunteers were ready to maybe manage conflicts if they came up. We have done that over the years, you know, actually like sat aside with people and you know, um, actually moderated conversations between people that you know, when they felt comfortable and they approached us wanting to do that. Um, so that's kind of a role that you know, um, we see it as sort of like our, our you know, responsibility to, to sort of provide that if we're going to provide a safe space. Um, but I don't know if anybody has questions. You guys should ask questions. Yeah. Just pass the mic to them. All oh, right. You need to talk about the original dispenser. I don't know if you're concerned about that. I don't know if you would do it. Do you do anything like this locally? So this actually gets organized locally um, with students from Georgia Tech and also folks that are remotely working with us from Long Island, Virginia. from Chicago, from the West Coast. From ThoughtWorks. From ThoughtWorks right here, yeah. Uh, also the Romania Ranch. Hello. So, um, so yeah, so there actually is a lot of Atlanta involvement. We don't have a Georgia expatiation of it, but that's something that we're interested in doing potentially in the future. But uh, you should definitely come to car sometime in your games. Other questions? <laughs> one, two, oh boy. Do time? Um, yeah, take one question. One more question? Uh, so I forgot hands, sorry. Thanks for writing, Sarah. <laughs> I was just wondering if you guys have written out anything about um, the things you learned about what works and what doesn't drive any comments in the world. Have we what? Have we, have we written anything? Oh. I mean, not formal, but just someone out there for us. Um, what? Oh. Oh, wait. Well, okay, so one thing that's coming up is that uh, Miriam and I are actually going to be in a book, uh, hopefully, uh, that's coming out that's the continuation of the Beyond Barbie and Mortal Kombat series. They're doing one that's actually on talking about diverse identities beyond gender this year. Um, and I also wanted to mention, um, there are some blog posts from year one of different games, and the one that is most standing in my mind right now is um, co founder Lane Unity from your one wrote a piece about our inclusivity statement. Our uh, SSM had anything to do with it that year. I totally didn't. But um, there's a really great way to include the statement itself and sort of reflecting on the process and how it came about. Um, and I think we have some colleagues in Australia who are going to build on that and maybe publish about it. So follow our Twitter uh, at Different Games. Is it just at Different Games? Yeah, um, just at Different Games. games. Um, we, whatever reviews, you can pass along to us, we just brought us there. Cool.